Welcome to another edition of How to Build Lifetime Cash Flow Through Real Estate Investing. I'm Rod Cleef, and I am super freaking thrilled that you're here. You're going to love the guy we're interviewing today. Uh, his name is Ryan Smith, and he is the principal of the Elevation Capital Group. Uh, they've got almost a half a billion in assets, so I'm sure he's got some very interesting things to, to say, and I'm excited to hear them myself. Ryan, welcome to the show, brother. Hey, thanks for having me. Absolutely. So, so please... Um, you know, give our listeners uh, a little bit of background on, on you and, and, and why real estate and maybe how, you know, a little bit about your, about your story, if you would. Sure. So I, you know, I come from a blue collar family. My folks were in real estate. They kind of did the fix and flip model and then ended up buying, fixing and holding, um, kind of finished with that. So growing up, we pretty much every weekend, we were at a rental property. Um, my dad also owned a string of restaurants and at 10, I started, I was the dishwasher, got paid $20 for 12 hours, just enough to buy a pack of baseball cards, I distinctly remember. So I've done it all. Um, but growing up, that was part of the family business, um, was digging trenches, stripping wallpaper. Um, you know, the, probably the worst thing I remember is re replacing a wax ring on a toilet. <laughs> um, yeah, those, those things you don't forget. I think my hands are just now clean uh, from that experience. But um, so did a lot, um, hard work, blue collar. And then, you know, my, my dad, great guy, very smart. He's ADD, ADHD, um, brilliant, quite, quite honestly. Um, so when I was a, a young person, I, I showed a penchant for analysis analytics. So um, I was pretty good with computers, started programming at a young age, um, taught myself uh, several um, computer languages and would write software uh, quite, uh, quite often. So my, my role in the family kind of gravitated to more of the analysis and helping back into my, uh, my family's purchase decision, uh, doing the cash on cash return, the cash flow, the debt coverage ratios, you know, all the different analytics that we were doing at the time. Uh, and it started with Excel. What, what kind of assets, forgive me, I'm sorry to interrupt. What kind of assets yeah. were you analyzing? It was primarily single family residential, you know, oh, wow. three bedroom, two okay. bath, you know, pretty, okay. that's, that's what my folks did. Um, so that's that's what it primarily was. And okay. then as I became a teenager, I, I had this idea. I always would write software for you know my teachers and my my school. I would write software that helped track tardy students. I would write you know I'd write software for anybody who um, had a problem that I thought I could solve. So I ended up writing software for my dad, unbeknownst to him. Um, I just thought I could make his life easier. Uh, so I wrote an application. That I my my goal was that he could sit down in a computer and um, and do it himself, you know, selfishly. You know, you can see why I, I wanted him to do that. Um, you know, I had plans to one day leave his home, and if I didn't solve for this, then I would probably not be allowed to leave. So, um, so anyway, I wrote this application for him, and it worked. Uh, I spent a whole summer, took three months to write, um, and anyway, it worked. And he showed somebody who showed somebody, and I ended up having you know, over many, many years, over 100,000 users of my various software programs that I wrote for real estate investors. So, hmm. um, so it's pretty, pretty interesting. Uh, yeah. It was a lot of fun. Wow. What a, what a, what a interesting background. So, so t talk about, you know, your foray into, um, into, um, you know, the different, uh, let, let's talk about what, what different asset classes are you in? So our primary focus is mobile home parks and self-storage okay. facilities. Those okay. are, um, by volume, that's that's you know the most mostly what we do. Okay, okay, and and talk about how that process started. Let's focus on mobile home parks just because it's multifamily in a way, um, and that's really the focus of my show. But let's talk about um, talk about maybe your first mobile home park, how you learned the business, what you did to you know to get started, and um, and you know maybe dig in on that a little bit. Yeah, so we, my, my wife and I, my wife has our, her own real estate background, uh, more from a management lens. And so uh, when we came together and started building a business, uh, we built uh, a portfolio of about 20, 25 single family houses, just like our parents had done. And we found out pretty quickly that it wasn't as scalable as we had hoped. We thought that, you know, once we got to around 25 homes, we thought that, you know, uh, margins would thicken, you know, profits would avail themselves to greater degrees. And that didn't happen. And so we, we sought to see, to find an asset class that was more scalable. Um, you know, all the, all the intangibles we wanted, uh, non-correlation, you know, cycle resilient to the extent possible, tax benefits, cash flow, capital appreciation, all of those things. And then scalability, we wanted 
um, type of business that was more scalable. So the, the business that we, so what we did is we spent a year and we evaluated you know, storage, billboards, apartments, um, you know, the gamut, office, retail. And our thought was we would put all the models on the table and the two that, you know, or the ones that were the best we would proceed with. And the the two best that we could find based on our analysis were storage and mobile home parks, not in mm. any particular order. So anyway, so mobile home parks was interesting. Um, at the time, you know, the cap rates were much higher than they are today. So we thought we would start with um, mobile home parks. Kind of one of the compelling features right off the bat was what I saw as a moat uh, or a uh, barrier to entry hiding in plain sight. And it, it's commonly referred to as NIMBY, not in my backyard. But the short, you know, the, the summation is, you know, they're needed everywhere. They're not allowed anywhere because they're hated everywhere. You know, and it's the, the same thing I would tell anybody watching this today is, you know, if you hear this concept of mobile home parks and you say this is the worst thing I've ever heard all I would ask you to do is to tell everybody, you know, just be very vocal about it because that's, <laughs> um, that would be self-serving, huge, self-serving huge, advice. I uh, love it. Yeah, no, you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, they, they, they won't let you build them. So um, it's, so, it's it, by the way, that's an asset stat class that I studied for a long time. My brother's deep into it. One of my best friends, I'm sure, you know, Kevin Bupp uh, is, yeah. is, is a player in it as well. And mm -hmm. um and, and yeah, no, I, I totally, totally uh, love the asset class. My brother still owns several parks. Um, so, so let's talk about, um, you know, some of the nuances of mobile home parks that makes them unique. Besides, yeah, so, the, besides the moat, I mean, obviously the barrier to entry is fantastic because they're not going to build them anymore. But besides that. Yeah, so a couple of things that in no particular order, you know, obviously the moat, which is durable and, and we like quite a bit. The other concept is it's, it's basically a residential ground lease or, you know, it's a residential equivalent of a ground lease. We, the way we operate the model is we want to own the land and not the home. And so nearly all of our residents own um, and maintain and care for their own home. And so what that typically creates is a, a more sticky customer in a good way, you know, because mm -hmm. the product you are providing them is not easily um, found elsewhere. Uh, so they don't really want to leave. Um, and so, um, and then they also own their own home. So for them to actually leave, they would have to, you know, hire a company to come in, hook it up, move it out. And that can cost, you know, depending on the area and the distance, you know, $10,000 plus or minus. So um, it creates a pretty sticky customer. Uh, so mm -hmm. it's, it's a residential equivalent of a ground lease. So that's mm -hmm. unique. Yeah. And, and, you know, I, and, you know, because of that, huge barrier to moving. Uh, most people can't afford it, frankly. Uh, you know, you, you do have kind of a captive audience and, and the ability to, you know, I would say ramp, ramp rents reasonably for sure. Um, I know that, uh, you know, some of the people in the space have been vilified when they, you know, raise the rents too much, the residents get together and raise hell and they make the, they make the front page of the paper. But, you know, it, 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 I always thought, yeah, when I saw when I saw lot rents of, you know, two three hundred dollars. I mean, where can you live for that kind of money? And and right. and, and it's got nowhere to go but up. Um, so um, talk about talk about some of the specific nuances or things that you need to look for if you're if you're going to look at a mobile home park. What are some? I mean, I know them, but I want I want you to you know tell my audience. Um, you know, what are some red flags? What are some you know maybe some of the some of the um, uh, just, yeah, just think, just take it from there. Take it from there. Yeah. So I'll, I'll start with the end in mind. Uh, Cause I'm, I'm really big in, in, in that. So I would, I would encourage your, your listeners or your viewers to consider what they're going for. Are they shooting for more of a cash flow play or a value creation with cash flow play? Um, we're, we're really big on focusing on the value of the dollar, not just the dollar. Um, mm -hmm. So you know, capital appreciation and income rather than just income. The reason why that would be important is if, if you value more capital appreciation, um, you may want to focus on a market that is a more stable quality, higher in Metro like Washington, DC, as opposed to Enid, Oklahoma, which mm -hmm. everybody's now running them, you know, Google maps to try to find out where that is because nobody right. knows. But the point is, um, you, you really need to decide what you're going for. So all things being equal, and there's a lot we can discuss on this, but 
per, per dollar of NOI, our whole business model is taking a property from X and taking it to Y, X and Y being NOI, net operating income. Mm-hmm. So all things being equal, the value of a dollar of NOI at a 10 cap is worth 10 times the dollar. So if you, if you add a dollar a month of NOI to a property, times 12 is 12 a year, you know, times 10, 10 cap, you have $120. That $1 a month is worth $120 in equity. That same property in, let's say, Washington, D.C., and let's say it's a five cap, $1 a month, 12 a year, divided by 0.05, takes you to $240 of value. So say you're adding a dollar, I'm adding a dollar, but my dollar is worth twice as much as your dollar. Um, so focusing on the end in mind, what it is, what is it that you are going for? Um, and then starting to look to effectuate your economic model um, in the markets that get you what you're going for. Hmm. So I, uh, that's. And is that, is that larger MSAs? Is it, is it, is it the, is it the quality of the, of the sub market? What, what, what are, what are some of the factors that affect that? Yeah. So it's, it's all of those things. I mean, ultimately okay. it comes down to there, there's a lot of variables that go into kind of the, the, the simple goal, which is predictable and consistent. Everybody wants predictable and consistent and there's a premium paid for predictable and consistent. So typically markets that have lower cap rates or higher multiples for value are more predictable, durable, consistent. Sure. And, um, and, and you've, you're able to find value add plays in those markets or are those more yield are. plays? Oh, okay. We are. So, we are. so guys, the yeah. difference between value add and yield is, is like, let me describe it a different way than, than Ryan just did. Uh, I, I guess a great example of, of yield plays would be Grant Cardone. I mean, he's paying 200000 a door for multifamily banking on rent appreciation, um, where value add uh, is, is, is forcing appreciation by sweat and, and the work that you put into a property. So what sorts of things, Ryan, um, do you do um, to add value to a mobile home park? Uh, you know, it's different than, a, than an apartment complex because you're not going in and, and putting in a new, you know, appliance package or plank flooring or, or you know, making giant improvements to the actual or maybe you are. So let me not speak. So talk, talk about the things that you do when you buy a park to add value. Yeah. So I'll go through a couple of things in no particular order. And I would also yeah. add that our, our model is probably a hybrid between what you just described. It's actually in cases a little bit of both. So okay. I'll give you, I'll give you an instant or a, a couple of uh, examples. So what makes a mobile home park look like a, a trailer park uh, and the connotation that it, that implies is usually the has to do with management of the property. So when you go through a mobile home park, if you see crap everywhere, stuff that should be on the inside of the house and the outside of the house, it looks like a trailer park. Right. So we want the, the stuff has to go. Um, right. People have to maintain their yards and all of those things. You can keep the stuff. You just have to put it somewhere. So that creates sight. a revenue that creates a revenue opportunity. So we um, regularly implement storage solutions on site. So mm-hmm. if you, you know, we, we uh, implement management, which means the stuff has to go and then we'll provide, you know, long-term storage if they would like, or if they'd like it in their yard, we'll bring in a tough shed, you know, and we usually charge them 1% the cost of the, the item. So if they have a tough shed and it's $3,000, they may not be able to afford that. We'll provide it. And then it's $30 a month on top of their lot rent. You know, mm. that comes out to about a 12% yield um, for that. So, so it, it, it brings up the condition of the property, but it also yeah. is a revenue generating. Love it. Great um, idea. So another item, just a couple more in that vein, cars. We have two cars per home. Um, we bought a property in Wyoming about a year ago. They had, you know, three to four cars per home. Um, <laughs> and so we don't tolerate that. Two cars per home. So we paved a, a one acre, a portion of the land out front, put fences, gate access, 100 striped parking spots. So you only have two parking spots per home. But if you have extra cars or boats or whatever, you're welcome to rent a space in the front. So it cleans up the look and the feel. It brings up the quality of the community, but it's also revenue generating. So those are, those are some other, you know, the obvious ones are we buy a park with vacant lots um, and we bring in homes and sell them away and create homeowner, you know, um, opportunities and add value through the income of that lot. And generally just to put a number to it. So let's say you have, um, we have several parks where this is the case. Let's say you have um, a park and you have 10 vacant lots and you can, the lot rent is $500 a month. Okay. Let's say. So that's mm-hmm. 6,000 a year of gross revenue. We have about, take a third away for easy math for an op, you know, operating expenses. So your NOI is $4,000 a year per space. 
Mm-hmm. Okay, at, if it's a if it's a ten cap market, that four thousand a year is forty thousand dollars. If it's a five cap market, it's eighty thousand dollars. So that's to go back to our discussion. But so let's say it's a five cap market. So that's eighty thousand dollars a pad. And if you have ten pads in a park, that's eight hundred thousand dollars of of um, you know potential value, value add. Correct, right. just on bringing it home, selling them away. So on what, what, is, what is your average home cost, uh, like, like a single wide, uh, three bedroom, two bath? Uh, what, is, what is the average cost of one of those? Uh, I know Buffett's got a company that sells them and, you know, what, 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 they've got financing packages and things, but, but what's the average cost? So there's a range depending on quality features and, and all of sure. that. It also depends on the properties we have. Um, sometimes we go with nicer, but as a range, Thirty thousand dollars plus or minus for an entry level, um, and then they go all the way up to eighty thousand dollars, and even some cases more. But that's that's usually the range. So forty, fifty grand, you get a decent home, and you and and in a, I mean, obviously, yeah. you're not going to be in all five caps, but but still, your chances are the value is going to exceed what you paid for the home. So that's that's a beautiful thing. I love the way that you've that you've taken your your second asset class. And incorporated it in the mobile home park. Some of those strategies I've not heard before. The tough shed, brilliant. The the the, the on-site storage, brilliant. Love it. And and it ties right into the you know the other asset class that you love. So um, yep. so uh, love that. Um, so what uh, you know? How how do you find? Do you do you do syndications? You do funds? Is that how you buy? That's I know that's how Kevin does it. You you do a fund and then you go out and find assets. We, we do. Um, we, for many years, we bought and grew a portfolio, uh, just my wife and I's capital credit right. kind of internally growing. Uh, right. We did our first fund, uh, fund one in 2010. We're now mm. on fund seven. Uh, we're real creative right. on our naming schemes. Um, right. so there'll, there'll probably be a fund eight and, and all of this, but, sure. um, but yes, and we typically find the properties. Uh, we, we, by the time we form a fund, we want to have, you know, typically one, two, three, four properties tied up and under contract before we even form the fund. So we tie them up with our capital and then we form the fund and raise so that the, the, the pathway to distributions to investors is much shorter. Uh, Let me ask so we you typically a question. don't raise and then find. Yep. Let me ask you a question. So, and this, this was always a concern. Um, it was one my brother voiced actually. If you start a fund, you know, so you've got two or three properties that you've, you've tied up with your own money, which, which is mm-hmm. smart, but, but then you're on the hook to to, to find the rest of the properties in a time frame, And, and my concern would always be overpaying at that because you, you kind of have to, you have to plug something into the hole. Um, you know, will, will you speak to that? I'm not trying to yeah. put you on the spot, but I'd love no, to hear no, what your a, thoughts are. It's, okay. it's a really great, it's a really great question. So I don't, so we, we never buy just to buy um, right. because that's, that's a terrible model. Um, right. So, but you're not forced to buy. So let's say for example, let's say you have a, a, property or properties tied up and you're doing your diligence, you're raising capital to capitalize them. Um, and let's say you find something in diligence that you don't like, you kill the deal for good reason. Now you create a problem in that you have the capital raised for that asset. And maybe another property comes um, that fits the model and you buy it. But let's say it doesn't, which creates the condition that you described. Right. So in that, in that event, you have the ability to return capital pro rata. So in that case, if you're sitting, if it's a $100 million fund and you have $10 million of excess cash that's no longer needed, cannot effectuate the plan of the fund, pretty simple. You, re- you return $10 million to investors pro rata. So basically everybody gets 10% of their original investment back, which some may not like because they say, hey, hey, I want the 100,000 working, not 90. But right. would you rather have 90,000 working well or 100,000 working poorly? So sure. as a fund manager, we are not beholden to deploy that capital without rigor. We're not, we have many options. Um, we're not, do, we're not. Do proud. they get a return on that capital uh, prior to deployment? It depends on the fund structure specifically. Ours right. does. So yours does. Ours so, does. So you're paying, you're paying even if it's not deployed, which is, which is a little risky too. That was another, that was another concern my brother raised. Cause you know, I mean, he's, we're, 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 like I said, fairly familiar with the model. I just wanted to hear it come from you rather than me preaching. Um, Okay. Well, fair enough. And, and, uh, and you're in multiple, like I think I saw 30 states. So you're all over. Okay. All and over. Yep. So talk about some of the high level, um, high level demographic uh, market related, park related, size related um, um, criteria at a real high level that, that just shoot from the hip that, that you'd be looking for 
uh, in your acquisitions? Yeah, so really everything you just described is risk related. So if you want to think of it in terms of risk overlays in no particular order, you want to consider, you know, kind of regulatory risk. You want to consider, you know, um, the Tenant Landlord Act specific to mobile home parks for each state. Um, you know, there's a couple of states. California is a little hairy, you know, mm-hmm. Oregon, Washington, New York, actually right. North Carolina. Um, so you want to consider that. Um, you want to consider rent control, uh, which is actually increasing. I actually think that'll continue to increase um, um, in the next decade or so. So um, you want to, you know, ideally buy in states where that's not likely to come about. Um, mm-hmm. And we, I have a whole view on that. But, you know, so regulatory risks, you want to consider acts of God risk, you want to consider uh, flood fire, you know, hurricane, tornadoes, um, you want to make sure you have adequate insurance. Um, utility infrastructure risks. Utility on, infrastructure. On a, on a well, you better have a, a plan B. Yep. Uh, yeah, so we don't buy private. We don't do private. We're just public utilities. So yeah, all city, public utilities. Okay, so you never water, have to think about that. Okay. Correct. Or, or in some cases, if it makes sense, maybe private one private with an opportunity to go to public. Um, right. You know, and we walk in knowing what that is, um, and, and knowing what it'll cost if you have to go there and all that. Right. Correct. And then having right. a budget for it. Yeah. Right. Um. So, so all public. So, let me ask you a question. Your 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 purchase structure is it primarily? You know, you, you threw some big numbers around. Are you paying cash for these properties, uh, or so, are you are you using financing at all? Because I know financing is challenging with mobile home parks. Uh, it's actually interestingly enough today financing is 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 much easier today because they because the agencies are 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 deploying a lot of capital in the space. So today, okay, well, you're buying the parks, the kind of parks that they'll that they'll they'll they're okay with public utilities, correct. for example, paved roads, things things that curbs and things of that nature that that, that they're going to want to see. Okay, well that that makes a big difference. I you know uh, uh, you know a lot of the players that I know are. Or, or will will take private utilities uh, and and things of that nature. So okay, so you're able. So you do you do use leverage then? We do. We so we we use leverage. You know, purchase. You know, debt to acquire properties. We will early in a fund. Sometimes we will pay cash for assets so we can aggregate a a portfolio and then take them out to the agencies for better pricing. Uh, but then once the, this is the reason why we do larger funds, our earlier funds were small, our more recent ones are larger, is because you have a better balance sheet. We have, you can get better debt options. So for example, fund seven, we have an, uh, you know, approximately a $25 million revolving line of credit that's secured by the balance sheet that we can use to acquire properties um, and then take them out to permanent financing while they sit on the line, which we, and you, we use. And you can get non-recourse agency debt, yes? Correct. Okay. Yeah, and I've seen we saw a term sheet recently that's up to twelve years IO. Wow! Holy shit! (laughs) Twelve years interest only on a mobile home park. Unbelievable! Yeah. Wow! (laughs) Wow! That just blew my mind. That blew my mind. Wow! You you have a hard time getting that on a on a B asset that's a multifamily. Holy cow! So that must be a really. I mean, uh, it has to be an incredible asset. You know, legacy type asset for sure. Yep. Yep. For sure. Um, For sure. Wow. So, so, so would you say you're competing with REITs or what, what, who, who are your biggest com- competitors with these large funds and these higher, you know, asset class type mobile home parks? Yeah, we, we compete with a little bit of, you know, a little bit of everybody. So REITs okay. and, you know, I think we've, we've probably lost three or four deals this year to REITs. Mostly yeah. those deals were storage related mm-hmm. um, to REITs who just paid significantly more than we were willing to pay. And we, we right. finished second in each one of those processes. Um, mm. But, um, but anyway, yeah, a little bit of everybody. We don't tell, tell me about your, of, t- sorry, yeah. uh, sorry, no, please no, continue. No, no, tell tell me, tell me about your team. So we have a, a really good team. Um, there's three principles that make all decisions related to purchase, sale, financing, management. Uh, I am one, my wife is another, and another, the third is Brian Don, uh, mm. a gentleman named Brian Don. So we are the three. Uh, we physically walk every property in the system, um, usually twice a year. Uh, last week, we walked eight properties. The week before, it was six properties. So we're constantly in the field. Um, but then we have a management team at the property management company. Um, the newest you, own, you, you manage, you self-manage everything then? Correct. The, the yeah. property management company is part of the umbrella. Um, yeah. Got so, it. but separate company, but it's part right, of the right, overall. right, right, right. Yeah. Different, different LLC, but but it, you're you're Correct. you're 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 the bottom line is you're self managing, and and 
you know, I, I've heard some horror stories about some of the management companies out there. Uh, I'm not going to name names or, or talk about who's having uh, horror stories, but, but definitely heard about sure. them. And, and uh, you know, and, and, I, and I can see why self-managing um, would be the way to go, particularly yeah. with, an, uh, you know, with a portfolio as large as yours. You know, the key with you is, so what the, what's the smallest space park you would, or home, I know you go by home, really. How, how, what's the smallest you would go si, si, number of uh, homes? So it's, it's been a continuum. We've learned a lot. So what we do today, we didn't do 10 years right. ago, so to speak. But today, um, I think the smallest park in our fund currently is, I want to say, a hundred and roughly 160 spaces is the smallest. Wow, that's big. Um, wow. That's crazy. I, I, I mean, so, so you're a completely different spectrum than, than, than some of the other people I know, because they'll go as low as 50, you know, as long as they can have on-site yeah. management, you know, um, it, yeah, I mean, the, obviously the, the rents have to support that. So the, the challenge is if you go back to the dollar example, so in our model, roughly every dollar a month is $240 of value. So how many of your viewers would go into parking lots today and look for a dollar if you knew it was $240 of value? I would, mm -hmm. my kids would. So the point is our entire business, all these hundreds of millions, tens of millions, all these big numbers all come back down to $1 and the pursuit of that dollar and the value of that dollar. So mm -hmm. at the end of the day, who's going to be better at finding dollars, an on-site manager where that's the only eyes that ever touched the property or us walking the property saying, well, what about this? What about this? Always trying to find a way to do it better. Um, so we think we're pretty good at it. We're always curious in ways we can find new ways to produce a dollar for the value it creates. So the problem with the 50 space model or 20 or 30 is you really, you, yes, you can hire a manager on site, but if you're not walking the property, if I'm not walking the property, who's driving it, who's really pursuing better on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I would argue possibly no one, which is a problem. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. Um, so, uh, let me think what else I want to ask you. So t talk about syndication for a minute, because, uh, one of the, one of the, one of the data points that, uh, that you had in your bio was, was really talking about mistakes that are being made in syndication. So, so, so I'd like to have you tell me sure. what, what, what you're alluding to there. Yeah, so just thematically, um, what I see a lot, to me, the value of a syndicate is the, the captains of the ship, the people running it. Mm -hmm. So what I see a lot of times is there's a lot, in the last two or three years, there's a lot of pop-up syndicators um, where they believe they can raise a lot of cash, but they may or may not be able to deploy it. So they don't feel confident in their ability as syndicators to stand on their experience, their track record, their bio, so in lieu of that, what I see a lot of is all of these really comprehensive advanced underwriting models being used as promotion and marketing tools. So mm -hmm. a lot of publishing of underwriting and, and models. And I, I, that's, that's not, we have underwriting models. Obviously, we have, you know, I have an analytical background. Um, so we have them internally, but we do not use them in marketing. The only, the only question when you publish a model for the purpose of marketing your fund, the only question in my mind is how wrong is it? It's the only question. So mm. people are investing potentially millions of dollars where the only question is how wrong is it? I, I think that invites risk because if you have 100, 200, 300 investors, all it takes is one suit from the investor base. And now that's a problem for the other 299. So part of our um, way of operating is not only reducing risk in the field by what we buy, how we manage it, but also the way we run our fund in that there's things we can do, will do, and there's things we won't do and can't do. And a lot of times people say, well, other people do this, other people do that. Give me and, examples. You know, uh, underwriting models. I had a- Okay, so, so you, utilizing a fancy underwriting model to, yeah. to, to, to entice people. To, and, and guys, just so you, you know, this is, this is uh, kind of eye-opening because, um, you know, it, it, is, it is a real problem in the industry because, frankly, you can make a, look, a deal look any way you want it to look. And unless you're sophisticated and really understand the asset class, you're, it's going to go right over your head. You're going to look at what's the cash on cash return in the IRR, not recognizing that in their, in their model, 
you know, they haven't put enough vacancy in while they're doing their reposition. They haven't stress right. tested the deal. They haven't, you know, they're not, they're, their operating reserves aren't there. They're, they're being way too optimistic on their expense ratio uh, and on and on and on and, and, and way too optimistic on, on their rent bumps, you know, on the, on the verge of a contraction here. So, so no, that's, that's a really compelling, okay, love it. Uh, great, great, great value there. So, um, one of your questions is around cycle resiliency. Now, obviously, that's probably going to be a plug for mobile home parks because they're certainly resilient. But is there more, more to it than that? There, there is. I mean, if you, if you look back, there's data, and, and I don't have this in front of me, but I'll, there, you can find data online. If you go and you look at, on a same store basis, the different asset classes and the mm-hmm. NOI growth over the last 20 years, Mm-hmm. The best performing asset class from, you know, uh, 1998 to present is self-storage in terms mm-hmm. of NOI growth. Mm-hmm. The second, very close second, is mobile home parks, which mm-hmm. is why those are the two we focus on. The third is multifamily or apartments um, mm-hmm. specifically. So to me, but the, the benefit of both of their, you know, if you look back, the way they grow over time differs. So storage is a little bit more elastic. And mobile home parks are a little bit more inelastic and very consistent. So one staggering statistic to me is based on the data for the last 20 years, um, mobile home parks have had not one quarterly decline in NOI growth for the, for the industry in 20 years. Um, I think, you know, I can go through, I think retail has been 24 quarters of decline. You know, there's, there's anyway, but mobile home parks have had zero. So it's a low beta a way you can also tell this is if you pull up the largest REITs in the space, look at their beta rating on Google Finance or whatever you use for charting, look at the beta rating. And that's the correlation to the market um, expressed as a, you know, a zero to two, uh, where one is at parity, zero is not correlated at all, two is highly um, correlated. So anyway, I think the beta ratings for mobile home parks right now are, I think uh, last I saw was roughly 0.3, which is mm-hmm. below one. So um uh, let, so if the market moves, it moves less than the market. Um, and then storage, I think, is around 0.4. So mm-hmm. low correlation by all the, 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 the ways you can measure it. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. You know, let me ask you this. Knowing what you know now, how old are you? If you don't mind my uh, 39. Wow. 39. Holy cow, you've done a lot for not even being 40. But t- 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 what would you tell your 20-year-old self, knowing what you know now about the real estate business? What might you do differently? Um, I'd focus on the value of cash flow as opposed to just cash flow um, mm. as a specific implementation, as a more of an emotive. Um, I, I would just say believe in yourself, and and I and I not the cheesy way of saying that. I mean, actually believe in yourself. Um, like actually do it. You know, don't right. let it tickle the ears. Let it meet your feet. Like actually believe in what you're doing. And um, how would you suggest someone struggling with that might accomplish what you just said? The belief in yourself, I think, yeah. um, I, don't, I don't know that any external means can, can solve that internal problem. Uh, you either do or you don't. Um, mm. but maybe there's a third party. I haven't gone to any third parties to, to help with that. Mm. Um, so I, I don't know. So I wouldn't be able okay. to. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. I, I, have, I have a lot, you know, Tony mm-hmm. Robbins, for example. And, mm-hmm. you know, and I, I teach a lot of the stuff at my boot camps as well on how to push through. I'm just curious if you had a oh, comment cool. on it. That's great. You, you, you were just blessed to have it and grew up with that self-confidence, I'm sure, instilled from your parents and, and watching them. Okay, fair enough. So what motivates you? Better. Um, so not more. Um, more is very different than better uh, to me. So uh, it's not a monetary goal or, a, you know, I don't have a, any of those kind of things. To me, mm. I like to make things better. Um, I think it's a stewardship. Um, um, I think it's stewardship driven. At least that's for me it is. We, um, if, I was, if I was born to another house uh, hold in another country, my outcome would be drastically different. So a lot of my result had to do with nothing that I control. So um, for me, then the question is, well, how do I respond to that? Am I better than another person? Obviously not. Um, but to me, I, I would like for things to get better because I had a role in the process. That would be. So, so, um, that's, that's, so that's is, that a, is that a common question you're asking yourself? How can I make it better? Every day. That, that's yeah. the dollar of NOI. Every, everything we touch, we, the challenge every day in our team, it's always, you know, how can we improve it? Everything can be improved every single day. Um, and that's the fun part is I don't know. That's why we show up and see what we figure out. 
Nice, nice, nice. Thanks for being on the show, brother. It was absolutely my pleasure to meet you. you and uh, really, really impressive uh, what you've accomplished uh, in your, so far. And really excited to see uh, how far you take this thing. I, I could see a billion in assets, no problem. Uh, anyway, it was a pleasure to meet you, buddy. Thanks for being Likewise. on. Likewise. Thanks for your right. time. Have a good one. Take, all right, you too.